First of all, great to meet you. And um, what a life story you have. Have you actually written the book yet? It's about time you did. <laughs> no, no, I did have a go uh, a few years ago with a local author. And I had a few people approach me over the years, as you might imagine, say you should do that. And uh, a recent approach, actually, uh, that we're, we're pursuing. I kind of, a few years ago, thought it was too soon. I hadn't done enough and I was too busy. And uh, so I've had a kind of stop-start interest in doing that. But I do think that I would like to, uh, like to do that. Mm. Maybe now's the right time. You started out as a youngster in Great Yarmouth, which is where I spent many, many years as a, as a youngster with my parents, having gone on holiday on the Norfolk Broads. Did you spend much time in the Rock Factory on <laughs> Regent Road? <laughs> ah, Regent Road, yeah. No, I, I definitely visited a couple of times, because I was on the other side of that fence, wasn't I? Uh, there wasn't a fence, really, but... Um, uh, it's a different perspective in it when you live somewhere like Great Yarmouth and you have the holiday season and the holiday makers, as we used to call them, you know, would uh, would arrive over over August and uh, and you arrived as one of the holiday makers. So kind of different perspectives of Yarmouth. Uh, we, we were there all, all year round. But I really liked being there. It was great to be able to swim in the North Sea. My God, that was cold. Makes Cornwall seem quite, uh, quite toasty. But uh, I had a great time there. We both grew up at, uh, at a similar time, being of similar age. Uh, strangely enough, you seem to look a lot more healthier than I am. <laughs> but in terms of the... Uh, that'll be your lifestyle, which we'll come on to in a while as well. But in terms of growing up, I mean, it, life was very, very different then. And um, the world was sort of looking for somebody to almost come along and make a bit of a difference into the way we all thought about different stuff, the environment, life, food, the lot. Yeah, I don't know if the world was looking um, actually, you know, consciously for that. But I remember, um, you know, being at school, I think probably aged around about 13 or something and thinking to myself, uh, I looked at all, all the cars on the road and I thought it was a lot. But of course, back then it wasn't compared to today. Uh, and I imagined the amount of fuel they were all carrying and uh, and where that came from. And uh, it just occurred to me that this stuff had to run out someday. And we were not talking about that at school. And I couldn't see anybody talking about that. And I thought that was shockingly bad. And so that was my first recollection of a, of a sustainability concern, if you like. And I was a bit of a kind of mad inventor as a kid. And I used to uh, spend my pocket money on... Uh, on stuff like including batteries to power these things I made and batteries back then weren't very good either and they did not last very long and then you had to throw them away and that looked like a hideous waste to me as well so these are some early thoughts I have uh, around sustainability I think the world was wanting focus perhaps a bit of leadership in that area but uh, nobody was really thinking about it at all can you put your finger on the on the the sort of point in your life where you you really sort of made the conscious decision to try to find a way to make a difference if you came from a family background, which was a family haulage business, was it? Am I right in saying? You'd have seen a lot of trucks going in and out and all that sort of stuff. And the brain must have been going around all the time. The point for me came much later in life, I would say in the early 90s. Uh, and I'd just spent a decade living on the road, um, which is a conscious decision. Uh, I'd spent a number of years just kind of rebelling, really, since leaving school, not wanting to be forced into the... Uh, kind of um, you know work life rat trap that uh, that uh, seemed to be the only choice and what, what I was being pushed towards and I just thought it was all wrong which just shouldn't have to live the way other people uh, you know wanted me to and I was a rebel at school as well so anyway long story short that culminated in me um, kind of leaving town life getting an old vehicle and just hitting the road and I spent 10 years in a variety of uh, trucks and buses and things I built myself and learned great life skills and stuff like that. But in the early 90s, I'd, I was parked on a hill outside Stroud temporarily um, and had a little windmill uh, powering my trailer so that I knew it was I was on a windy site and I saw the first wind farm built in Cornwall. It was 1991. I went and spoke to the farmer about it and I was quite inspired by the sight of these big machines. And uh, then I had that epiphany, really, that was... Um, I could spend another 10 years living this low-impact lifestyle uh, myself, uh, or I could drop back in and try and build a big windmill on the hill I was living on and to try to make a big difference, a bigger difference. And um, so I just set out to do that in around about 1991. Mm. You mentioned the, uh, the variety of things that you lived in over the years. I mean, I, I found notes, I don't know how much of it is true. Fire engine? Yeah, I had a fire engine. Uh, I lived in that for about five years, actually. Uh, living in the cab, if you can believe that. 
I had uh, a helicopter support vehicle from the Queen's Flight, which was the poshest thing I had. They only made three. They were coach built. And I bought it out of an auction for 500 quid because it wouldn't, it wouldn't run. Um, but I got it running, no problem. And it was an incredible uh, machine. Four-wheel drive, petrol engine, uh, helicopter tender is what it was. Uh, I had a variety of buses, some ambulances, um, yeah, all sorts of stuff. That must bring with it its own set of challenges, though, at that particular time. But I guess that what you were looking for was this alternative way of life. I note that one, one word which constantly comes up, which must drive you bonkers, is the word hippie that comes up. Where people have their own impression of what that lifestyle was back then. But in fact, new age travellers call people what you will at that stage. We're all sort of moving one general direction with a common cause and living life differently. Yeah, I have no problem with the word hippie. I use it all the time to self-describe. Uh, I remember as, as a kid growing up in, in the uh, late 60s and 70s being fairly impressed by what I thought was, uh, you know, the kind of hippie outlook on life, uh, thinking it was a good thing. So I probably took that on the road with me. And I, I know some people use the term New Age Travel and stuff. I don't think the labels exactly matter, to be honest. There was quite a tribe on the road, actually. And um, it was interesting because we used to... Uh, had a, there was a pattern to life. In the winter, you would find somewhere you could park up to kind of get through the winter, somewhere where you wouldn't get evicted, for example. You might find some local work uh, and that kind of stuff. And then come spring, summer, we'd all hit the road and we'd converge at the big festivals up and down the country and you'd meet people that you hadn't seen you know, since the previous summer and that kind of stuff. It was, uh, you know, it was great, um, great fun, great pattern of life. There was a lot of publicity at the time for, um, for I mean, I, I think I think Green on Common was the first thing that sort of really hit the public consciousness, wasn't there? And then there was um, Molesworth was the next thing. I gather that you were you were there for that, as well as the, the Battle of the Beanfield, which, of course, is uh, legendary. We talked about that a lot on The Late Show when looking back. And, I mean, how do you sort of reflect back on those times now? Uh, they were surreal, really, because um, I was in one of these winter kind of... Um, uh, I don't know what would you call it, kind of bolt holes, um, the winter before Molesworth in Wales, um, in some woods, Clankaby Common was the place, and I was working on an organic farm, I think it was probably the first one in England at the time, um, and, you know, life was great, and then somebody said, look, there's this site at Molesworth, and these guys have occupied the land to prevent American cruise missiles being deployed, and I thought that was a great cause. And so one day we all just fired up our engines and assembled on the road, and we trucked off to Cambridgeshire, which is quite a trek, especially in some old vehicles. And you can imagine, you know, no number plates, no insurance, no tax. You know, we, we, were, we were a ragtag convoy. And I think we arrived there late one night. And, uh, and, and it was a fabulous place full of, full of really great people. And I spent the rest of the winter and early spring there. And we got evicted really early one morning. I'll always remember it because uh, Michael Heseltine flew in. He was a defence secretary back then. He flew in by helicopter wearing uh, army camouflage uh, clothes and makeup for TV. It was quite a, uh, quite a contrast. And, and we were held back behind a fence by a kind of a small army of police and uh, a military while he did his interviews and stuff. Uh, but just before that, we'd been surrounded in the small hours of the night by, by the army, uh, this... Uh, this whole convoy of vehicles just drove around us. We could see their lights, and then they all turned inward at one point. It was really quite uh, spectacular and surreal. And then they just sat there having surrounded the entire camp. And uh, within 24 hours or so, they'd pushed us all out onto the road. I'd estimate probably 150 vehicles. But in the process, they created this uh, this rolling convoy that then became a big focus of the sun and uh, and media like that that then found its way to, uh, to the beanfield, wherein the other problem happened. But uh, it was an interesting and quite special time. The thing about the beanfield thing, which comes, comes back to me every time I read about it now, is that the one thing which people can so easily forget if they only remember the press coverage of the incident at the time, is they can actually miss one important point in all of this, and that was... There was a major change to policing as a result of all of that because it really was a very serious event to have been involved in. But do you actually remember it with with any sort of um, fondness, if you like, in terms of the way that it it sort of changed the way police operated around those sort of events? Yeah, I don't suppose I saw the changes. I just saw it as an incredibly... uh dark event actually the uh, you know the violence um, of the police at that time and of the state in effect because you know they didn't do this off their own back um, 
this was state coordinated violence against a group of people that were felt to be challenging the status quo and subsequently it was only a couple of years ago the guardian unearthed letters from uh, margaret thatcher around the time of the conference the tory conference that was bombed and um, in it there was a draft of her speech in which she was going to blame uh, travelers along with uh, miners for uh, you know the dis- the social disruption in britain and, and uh, naming us as the biggest threat to that uh, but subsequent to the Brighton bombing, she changed that to uh, to be the terrorists, and and I think that gives you a, a feel for you know just how high up in government the issue of uh, of travellers, hippies, uh, or what you like, was as uh, as a perceived threat. So I'd say it was a very dark event. State uh, condoned violence absolutely. Uh, it was indiscriminate, uh, not just men but women and children as well. It was. It was a shocking, uh, awful thing. Because there was an awful lot of denial by the police at the time that was later then overturned and shown for what a lot of people feared it was. That's right. The early media coverage did show some really shocking scenes and then the BBC lost an awful lot of footage that had that in it. There's a local landowner there, he owns Savanac Forest, and uh, he allowed us to stay there uh, after... Uh, the events of the Beanfield. The police asked if they could come on and finish the job, <laughs> and he refused, uh, refused them access. And uh, he was there on the day, and he said, and I remember his words. Uh, he said uh, he'd seen men born and he'd seen men die, but he'd never seen an event like that in his life. So let's um, turn our attention now to the days when you're sort of at Glastonbury and uh, you've got your your own ideas, energy related and trying to help people get their sound systems up and running for those who wanted to listen to music. And and then suddenly, was that, no pun intended, your own personal light bulb moment? Uh, no, by then I'd already had that uh, epiphany and I was living on this hill outside Stroud. I was working on um, the planning process for this first big windmill, learning about big wind at the same time. But I had, from my time on the road, a certain number of uh, things, like I had uh, I had a windmill, I had some old train batteries from a scrapyard, and I had an electricity pylon that I'd converted into a 60-foot tower that was something I could quickly assemble. It was in sections, and it was on the back of the lorry that I'd built. I had a crane on it, and so I could throw up this 60-foot tower with a windmill on top and the batteries at the bottom, and run a series of transportable early mobile phones, the ones that were a couple of house bricks put together. Um, So I ran this thing called Wind Phones uh, at Glastonbury, and that was a way of raising some cash to fund the development of this big windmill. So uh, they were were in parallel. I was uh, just just sitting here trying to think of an occasion where I I could ever recall a conversation with anybody who needed to ring somebody who got a a, a pylon they could sort of help me out with. You know, skip high, yeah, pylons. (laughs) The, the, mad, the mad thing was it was the very early days of mobile phones and up until then at Glastonbury BT used to come in and put in these landline connected phones and charge everybody a pound a minute to make a phone call which was an incredible uh, price and uh, and yeah, when I came up with the idea I mean everybody around me said oh you know who's, who's going to want to use it you know it's a, it's a kind of you know, not a very sensible idea, but we put it up in the greenfield and we were queued uh, four wide because we had four phones and, and 10 or 20 people deep from the first day to the last day. And it was really amazing listening to the conversations as well because uh, at the beginning people was, were ringing somebody say, I've just got to Glastonbury and they would do this, they would look up and they were saying, I'm calling you on a wind powered phone, I don't know how that works. And, and then by the end of it, they were arranging to be picked up and they were like, yeah, I'm calling you on a mobile, oh, no, on a wind powered phone. And uh, it was such early days for mobile phones, people thought we had our own network. They were like, oh, can I get one of these at home? And I'd be saying, it's just a mobile phone, but we're powering it from, from the wind. And the amazing thing is uh, that from, from those ideas to where we are now, and I mean, sitting in your, in your own office here at uh, company headquarters, we'll come to the football ground in a minute, but uh, just looking at this wonderful open space which you've created, I mean, down to the finest details. I noticed on the outside of the building, I was uh, just uh, observing on the way in, you know, the little bird boxes to help wildlife, all, the, all this sort of attention to detail. Did you ever really have a personal dream that it might lead to? To where you now are in life or is it just something that's sort of a bit like a runaway train if you know what I mean? Well I, I kind of ad hoc my way through life really. I had plans and ideas but um, but no I never uh, would have sat in the 1990s and thought this is what uh, you know what, what could happen but not long after I could see we were about to build the first windmill that took five years and when I could see it coming uh, it was obvious to me that I should try and build some more 
And um, so then uh, I realized that to do that, I had to get a fair price for the power. And to do that, I had to cut out the middlemen, the power companies, to reach the, the users of electricity directly. And so that was where the idea of Ecotricity was born. So we've evolved you know, through a series of experiences like that. You, you, you can't sit back in the 90s and foresee today because it takes shape in a series of steps that are informed by the experience of the previous step is what I'm trying to say. Well where we are now in terms of your the size of your company and the, the number of people you employ I mean is that something that you, you ever envisaged really because I mean you know from, from your earliest thoughts about what you would be likely to achieve in life or what you might want to achieve in life here we are now where you are directly responsible for employing a load of people being such an important hub in the local community and everything must give you I would imagine a great deal of personal satisfaction Uh, yeah I suppose so Um, I mean I never never really spend a lot of time thinking just how big can we get the issue for me is just how much change can we bring if you look at the scale of the problems in in the sectors that we focus on that's energy transport and food 80% of all personal carbon emissions and climate change related problems come from those three things the way we power our homes the way we travel and what we eat so we focus on what change we can bring to those sectors how big we get or don't get in the process is, is not a factor for me and yeah um, it's nice to employ a lot of people and we brought uh, a real economic boost to Stroud and Stroud is a lovely place so I'm, I'm glad to see that it comes with responsibility as well though uh, for those people um, so it's uh, It's a bit of both. I think it's just a lovely outcome. I wasn't driving around in those days looking for a niche uh, or or for a job. I really liked the way that I lived and, uh, you know, living outside of uh, conventional life really suited me and being self-reliant and making my own things. I just really liked it. I think it's just a lovely outcome that uh, the one thing that interested me possibly most being renewable energy turned into um, something from, what, 25 years ago. Um, we were really at uh, the foundations of Britain's uh, renewable energy industry, as it is today, has turned into something that's been uh, so good for so many people. But it's also led us to focus on other sectors such as transport and food. You know, we built that national network of electric vehicle charging points, for example, and uh, promoting a plant-based uh, diet for many years, and that's become very popular in the last couple of years. You know, I think we've been probably um, ahead of the curve on those three big issues of energy, transport and food. And for me, it's all about changing the way we live because we need to live more sustainably. And that goes right back to my early days in Norfolk when I was simply troubled by the way uh, life was so wasteful. Let's, before we uh, we sort of close the interview today, talk a bit about uh, Forest Green Rovers and uh, your tri- achievements there. Because, of course, from first coming into the club, I think in 20, 2011, was it, when you first sort of came? 2010, beg your pardon, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, came in alongside the uh, uh, the club there and now in, in the role of chairman there. A man suddenly deciding to effect change in a world that was not accustomed to the level of change which you might have envisaged was it was it a sort of a, a softly softly approach that you had to to go with there to to change the outlook no no it wasn't um because it couldn't be really i mean it was as far as we could make it so the journey from uh, conventional diet to veganism took place over a few years but the fact that we were going to do it was absolutely clear and up front and there were some other changes that just had to be made um, you know that was happenstance for us green we didn't uh, set out to uh, buy a football club or, or to you know run a football club uh, I am a fan of football I always have been and um, Forest Green was simply our local football club that was in trouble in 2010, 125 years old, and they invited me to come and talk to them and said they just needed a little bit of help to get through the summer. It turned out they needed a lot more than a little bit of help, and um, we found ourselves facing the choice of walking away and seeing them fold or uh, taking complete responsibility. So I decided to do the latter, but in the process, decided that we would bring all of our, uh, our ethos, our principles, our learnings and knowledge in sustainability, we'd bring it into football and we'd use that as an opportunity to address a new audience, one that's relatively untouched by eco-messaging and really rather kind of counterintuitive that they might even be open to eco-messaging. So it was a challenging audience, I think, um, but I like a challenge. And so uh, we decided to do that. And, you know, the rest of the Forest Green story is, 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 quite, is quite nice. Where we are today in League Two, we've just started our second season. We're in a playoff spot. Um, our 
publicity around the world is just phenomenal. And, uh, you know, we never foresaw that back in 2010. We got promoted at a Wembley Playoff final just over 12 months ago. And in the following 12 months, we reached 3 billion people around the world uh, on online print, uh, TV and radio. Just an incredible reach. And the veganism was really the kind of tip of the spear of that story. Um, for most media and for most people, that's what's most counterintuitive. How can you have a football club that's vegan, you know, aren't fans kind of uh, rioting? And how can the players play on a vegan diet kind of stuff, you know? Uh, which is great because that kind of um, improbability has gained us the attention of the media and the chance to communicate uh, resulted in us uh, popping to the UN last October to talk to them about what we're doing. Uh, they're planning a big programme to engage sports and sports fans in uh, in the fight against climate change. And one of our big hopes back in 2010 was that uh, we could take the passion of sports fans or football fans in our particular case, and we could uh, we could harness that and point it towards the environment. And that's working. Do you ever find yourself in the position where you sort of just sit there and have a little quiet snigger to yourself because there were so many people who said it couldn't be done. And now here you are, as you say, in a strong position at the moment in League Two, having come so far, having proved everybody wrong at every step of the way, it seems. I don't spend a lot of time looking back, actually, in interviews. is is probably about the only time I... I uh, recall these things. I, I'm mostly looking forward. So in terms of football, for example, we're not there yet because we're planning to get to the championship. So we've taken one big step. We've got two bigger ones to come. I'm sure that that's very possible, especially when we look at... I just wrote these down You're earlier. Your You're, bets now, aren't pardon me? You're just hedging your bets by not saying it's, it's not possible. No, I, you see, the thing is, I, I, actually, you know, it's an interesting thing because you say that, but, I mean, I grew up supporting a club which I never, ever thought I would foresee the day that they would ever win the Premier League, Leicester City. And it happens out of nowhere. So I'm not one who dismisses stuff like that because I've seen the miracle happen for for my lot. It's been and gone now, mind you, but it's your turn next. Yeah, but it was was a joke on my part. Having just talked about all the naysayers saying it wasn't possible, I just just thought it would be funny to say you're hedging your bets there. You do realise I'm going to hold that piece of audio because in a few years' time, you see, it may well be that you'll you'll suddenly realise that it all came true again but you know there we are I mean, I mean just I'm convinced it's entirely feasible when we set out a plan such as this we, we, we don't just kind of dream it up um, you know we put a lot of thought into it and what we're planning to do is entirely within our uh, capabilities I mean here we are now where you have been tagged greenest football club in the world first vegan football club in the world and now the first carbon neutral football club in the world There may be a lot of people listening to this programme of mine tonight asking the question, what does that mean in practical terms? Yeah, that's a programme from the United Nations. Um, They're encouraging organisations of all kinds around the world to go carbon neutral or climate neutral. And uh, it's a three-step process of firstly measuring your carbon footprint, secondly reducing it as far as you can using things like renewable energy and, uh, you know, uh, LED light bulbs and that kind of stuff. Uh, and then thirdly, the part of your emissions that you can't get rid of, uh, offset them through a United Nations uh, recognised program. And they invited us a couple of months ago to take part in that. We'd already done steps one and two because that's natural to us to know our footprint and to have reduced it as far as possible. So all we had to do was to offset a couple of hundred tonnes of carbon dioxide. And um, we were there. And yeah, we became the first sports club, in fact, not just football club, in the world to achieve that. And I'm off to New York to... Uh, yeah, to pick up some kind of award for that from the UN yeah, uh, uh, during Climate Week, which is pretty cool. How does how does all that sort of thing sit with Del Vince, the man who I've referred to years back being a man with a, a bit of a vision, whatever that was back then, you know, to suddenly finding yourself being put into the spotlight like that? Well, for me, it's all part of um, this opportunity to communicate. This is the big thing um, that we seek. It's not money. Um, it's changing the world and I think there, there are two ways to do that uh, one is to get on and do stuff and show people through doing and, and hope that people pick that up uh, we see that working in football and in what we've done in green energy as well uh, that works and the other way is to communicate with people to, to go out to a wider audience to talk about the problems and, and the answers that are out there and football has given us the most incredible global platform and voice for that um, and uh, working with the United Nations, which is, uh, which is what's coming uh, on that topic, engaging sports and sports fans in the issues of sustainability is, is just 
an amazing opportunity that I never would have dreamt of. I suppose at this stage it's too difficult for you to forecast what may be on the horizon in that front because you know you're going to talk to them but you don't know at this stage what that might bring in the future. No. It could be far-reaching. Yeah, it could be. They've already invited us to the next uh, climate conference in Poland to uh, to speak there uh, about our work. Um, uh, it's just a great platform because you know it gives us access to uh, sports bodies and clubs around the world. We already met a bunch last October. People like the San Francisco 49ers, for example. You know, we sat around a table and they're saying, "How on earth can I go vegan uh, at, at my club?" You know, without having a riot. And so we have a chat about that. And, and uh, you know, uh, German Football Association saying, "How can we get vegan uh, food into into German football?" And you know, that's an amazing opportunity. I'd love to. Uh be a fly on the wall on a conversation if you could find yourself in the company of President Trump to have a conversation about, you know, the Mr. Burgerman himself. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, there are so many issues, aren't there, whether it's climate, or American lifestyle, everything about it. You know, it, it seems very much at odds. You've got, you've got a real, you can go in as a flag bearer with this one. Yeah, I think I think America's in a in a in a funny place right now with the president they have. I mean, they're turning into a rogue nation, aren't they, on issues like climate change. Uh, and trade, actually, world trade and all sorts of things. Um, hopefully it's an aberration and it'll get corrected at their next election. I've uh, one final question which I'd like to ask you, which um, is not really intended to be particularly political, but we are in a position now where we're sort of questioning where, with Brexit and everything else that, that's on the horizon, however it all pans out. We've got the issue of North Sea oil, gas, people talking about fracking, the whole lot. There's a whole massive agenda ahead of us isn't there how do you how do you sort of see this all panning out because it seems to me that people like you are going to have a very important role to play in all of this yeah um we've been doing this a long time and you know governments have come and gone and policies have got better or worse the most recent government uh, before Theresa May uh, Cameron's government were very bad for renewable energy for example Despite pledging to lead the greenest government ever, he, he did the opposite. Uh, but we see these reversals uh, come from time to time. I just think that the the move towards more sustainable living is an inevitability. It's only a question of when it happens and how it happens, if you like, because climate change and the earth running out of resources, these are facts of life. And we can be in denial for a certain period of time, and in different parts of the world we're in different stages of denial, let's say. Uh, but these uh, these factors are real, and we have to make the changes to accommodate them. So we just carry on doing our job. We focus on the issues of energy, transport, and food. We've got the answers. We've got the answers for Britain on all of those issues, and we can be much more sustainable uh, and, and happier as a country uh, as a result, and we'll stay focused on that. Pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. No problems. My pleasure too.